What's the most valuable thing you've learned in your life so far? I don't know how to that. This is not a, this is not a question that is possible to answer. What are your thoughts on finasteride for hair loss? Amazing. <laughs> Does hard work always lead to success? How do you feel about that sort of question, Tamor? Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, my name is Ali. I'm a junior doctor working in Cambridge, and today I'm joined by my brother. Do you want to introduce yourself? Hey, I'm Tamor. I'm Ali's brother. <laughs> I studied maths university, I graduated a couple of years ago, and I'm currently working on my own startup with one of my friends. It's very exciting. Isn't that cool? Well, have we actually started recording? We have started recording. Oh, okay. Right. <laughs> this is not the way we normally talk to each other. It's a, lot, it's a lot more friendly on a camera. So today we're going to be answering some questions that people sent in via Instagram. So things like, you know, motivation, productivity, but also there's a question about data science in there somewhere. Ooh, sounds great. Let's Fantastic. All right. So I've got some questions. We'll load them up and obviously we'll put timestamps in the, uh, in the video description <coughs> and in a pinned comment. Sorry. <laughs> in the video description and in a pinned comment so you can skip around the video if you feel like it. How do you effectively deal with procrastination, says Akash. Any ideas? <laughs> As a chronic procrastinator. There's a nice movement in certain Twitter spheres at the moment, which is sort of in favor of things like procrastination. But the point is to like guide your procrastination in the right ways. So actually a lot of the things that I'm quite glad I did over the past few years have kind of started out as I had, I had something important I was supposed to be doing and I was procrastinating from that and I ended up doing this other thing, which was actually valuable in the end. So I think if you have this sort of, uh, this stack of responsibilities, you know, you should be doing number one, you know, you have to do number two at some point. As long, as long as the whole stack is roughly valuable, it, it actually doesn't matter too much if you're procrastinating because you're still doing something valuable. And I think there is something to be said for doing the things you feel like doing. If you're, if you're sort of really forcing yourself to do something, then I feel like you're not gonna do it to as good a degree as if you were like really into it at the time. Haby says, how do I motivate myself to study more? You're an expert on study motivation. <laughs> yeah, you, I mean, you reckon? I haven't got a clue. I, I was never particularly good at this. You went to Oxford, by the way. You didn't mention it at the start probably embarrassed. No, I honestly don't know. I don't think I was particularly good at studying at university. I think environment actually helps. So um, it took me about four years to realize I actually don't work best in my bedroom where I have lots of distractions. It took me about three years to realize that actually going to lectures is more productive for me than thinking I can stay at home in my room and read the lecture notes and do it in half the time. That never really works out. Yeah, and we actually have a full like 50 minute podcast episode. By the way, if you don't know, we have a podcast together. It's called Not Overthinking. You can find it at notoverthinking.com. And so far, at the time of this recording, we've released like 17 episodes. 18, 18 episodes. 18 episodes. We've been doing this every week for the last 18 weeks. And one of our episodes that we'll link in the video description is all about motivation. And we discuss in depth kind of techniques to get motivated, but also how to think about motivation and how and not to think about motivation. So if you're interested in motivation, you should definitely check that one out. How do you pull yourself up after something doesn't go to plan? Like not getting the grades you want for uni or equivalent. So we'll link the podcast episode where we talked about this for like an hour as well. Um, any thoughts about how to, how to pull yourself up when things don't go according to plan? I don't think this is anything anyone can advise anyone on. I think this is, this is, I know, this is an internal battle that we all face. Two random dudes on YouTube can say, do this when something didn't go according to plan and feel this way when something didn't go according to plan. But that, that's not actually how it works. I, no, you're gonna say no, there are, I read all these books, right? I read about stoicism and uh, there are actionable things you can do. Maybe there are, <laughs> but I feel like it's mostly an internal battle and like no one can really give you the answer to this. I agree that it's an internal battle, but I think it's an internal battle of diversifying your identity. The reason we feel down about certain things that don't go our way is because A, our hopes and expectations are tied up in that thing, but B, our identity is in some way tied up in that thing. Like if I tried really, 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 really hard to get into a particular university and set my whole identity based on the fact that I was gonna become an, a medical student at Oxford and then I didn't end up getting in, I would feel absolutely crushed and there's not much anyone can do about that because all of the previous time that's kind of led up to this moment has set me up for this disappointment. So what most people suggest is that you diversify your identity. Like in an ideal world, our identity would, and our sense of self-esteem would, wouldn't come from anything external at all. It would purely be internally generated. I have value as a human being. I know I'm gonna be fine. That's kind of like the ideal, but in, in real life, we all have our identity tied up in various different things. And I find that for me to, to kind of hang my identity off various different things rather than just on being the guy with good grades or what I used to be in school. That's been really helpful for me, which means if any one thing doesn't go my way, it means that I've got these other things that I can make myself feel good about. Yeah, I, I actually back that. That's pretty, yeah, that's that's pretty, pretty good action of advice. It's good, isn't it? <laughs> But, okay, from Ardil who says, any advices on starting an online business? Yeah, I've got some advices on that front. Uh, I'm gonna make a video that breaks this down like properly in depth. Point number one is you should learn how to code 
And it's really also helpful if you learn the basics of kind of web design, because being able to code and being able to design stuff to make it look pretty is an absolute superpower when it comes to starting an online business. Uh, any other general tips? I, I think I might actually disagree with the learning how to code God. thing. Okay. Uh, I think nowadays, yeah, I think a lot of people think there's a huge barrier to entry in starting like an online business, but now there's, there's tools that let you do pretty much anything. If you want to start like an e-commerce thing, you don't need to know a single line of code. You can use something like Shopify. Even if you want to make something a bit more custom, there are now actually tools that let you do that without writing code. So don't worry too much about the code thing. I think developing developing design taste is really valuable, like you said, because uh, then you can get like really high production value in anything you do. Um, and that that's just like an immediate boost when you're getting started. But I wouldn't worry too much about the code. I want to disagree with that. <laughs> I think the code thing is kind of important because knowing the basics of coding actually opens you up to a lot more business ideas than you would have thought poss possible. So the mistake that people make when deciding to start an online business is that they think, you know what, I'm gonna sit down with my mates and we're all gonna brainstorm business ideas. But all the common advice in the entrepreneurship world is that this is not the way to get ideas. The way to get ideas is to identify problems in your own life that you can then solve using technology. And just knowing the basics of code just opens your mind up to the realms of possibility, like what's possible to make on the internet, even if you're not gonna be the one to fully custom code your product it is kind of useful knowing how yeah, to code. Yeah, look, I, I back that. I'm just saying yeah. that if you lead by saying, if you want to start an online business, you have to know how to code. I feel like that implies a higher barrier to entry than. All oh, right, next one. Wandering Zephyr says, how to balance and prioritize reading books, listening to multiple podcasts, audio, etc." I listen to an awful lot of podcasts. I think I kind of put my podcasts in two categories. There's, there's podcasts I listen to sort of for fun and for entertainment. So there's one called uh, Conan O'Brien Needs a Friend. Conan's a, a really famous uh, American late night talk show host, very funny guy. And those are always really funny. And so I listen to those kind of for fun, but then I also listen to a lot of like businessy, techy kind of podcasts where I'm just trying to glean information. And so for those ones, I listen to it on like 2X speed, you know, skipping the pauses in between using the, the podcast app. I kind of have two different workflows. Um, I should probably do more note-taking when listening to podcasts. Yeah, I actually do note-taking when listening to podcasts. Uh, so if I'm listening to a podcast and driving in the car, I will tap my AirPods and be like, hey Siri, record a new voice note. And then I, as I'm driving, I'll record a voice note about the stuff that I listen to in that podcast. Or if it's like a really big point that I'm like, oh my God, I will literally stop the car on the side of the road, open up Evernote and put some notes into that or open up Notion, depending on which app I'm using that particular week. Equally for, re for reading books and stuff, for, when it comes to fiction, I don't read multiple books. I just have one that's ongoing and then I switch to the next one. But at the moment I'm reading about six different nonfiction books. And each night I just think before sleeping, when I've got my Kindle in front of me, what do I most feel like reading right now? And then I just kind of read some of that. Yeah, I think uh, one thing that really helped me sort of read more, and we, we've talked about this in the podcast, we should check out, uh, is that I stopped thinking that I have to sort of read a book like cover to cover every single word. Um, and so what I'll often do is, especially if it's like a nonfiction kind of businessy book from which I'm trying to get information, I'll sort of skim it, give it like a first pass, skim it and see if it's gonna be any good, see which like sections I particularly care about um, and then sort of read those and maybe make notes on them. I, I don't worry too much about like reading cover to cover anymore. Yeah, good point. And we will link that podcast episode as well. It's called something like, how do we get into the habit of reading consistently? Yeah. Where we talk about this for like 40 minutes. Cause I read a lot, you don't read that <coughs> much. And we're kind of sharing some thoughts about yeah. the topic. HR, the 18th, 17th, X, XV, XV, 17th. I 17th. 17th. How has reading books over many years helped help you in any aspect of life? I haven't I haven't read that many books, but I am constantly reading stuff online, and I think in the long run you actually do become very clued up on the things that you are reading about. So, for example, I read a lot about tech and business and stuff. I can't point to a single thing that I've read and said, "Oh, that particular thing was really useful." But just accumulating a wide range of kind of knowledge from reading stuff. So it's interesting you say that. So um, one of the kind of new trends in reading books these days is where you start to think of books as if they're blog posts. There's no kind of um, prestige associated with reading a book. There's no prestige associated internally with kind of reading it sort of cover to cover, as you said. But instead, you're quite happy to kind of skim it, get the lessons you want, and then highlight some bits and then leave it. So I find that helpful. And and secondly, I've got a video called Three Books That Changed My Life. <laughs> so in that bit, in that, I mentioned Four Hour Workweek by Tim Ferriss, Anything You Want by Derek Sivers, and Show Your Work by Austin Kleon. So I think those are good starting points if you're looking for specific book recommendations. I'll chuck in one recommendation on top of that, oh, yeah? which is The Courage to Be Disliked. Oh, um, good book. It's quite a click -y title. If you just forget about that, then it's really good. Um, I was surprised at how much of an impact just like a couple of the ideas in this one book had on me. Do you have some advice for earning money during school slash university period? <laughs> Using your summers productively, and uh, the summers are always a good way to earn money, uh, depending on what you want to go into. Lots of people do internships where they make money or get, you know, summer jobs. Obviously we're into the whole like online business thing. So I'd highly recommend trying to set up some kind of online business that gets you some kind of passive income. You've got videos about this, I'm sure. Uh, I don't actually yet, <laughs> but it's, they're, they're, they're coming soon. So thank you for the, the cheeky plug in advance. Yeah. For, for earning money during school, I 
worked at this tutoring agency thing and made a, a six pounds an hour, which was pretty good because I was doing that four hours a week and that was 24 pounds a week. Six times four, 24, is that right? 24 pounds a week. Yeah. Which was 96 pounds a month. Oh. And I, I was like super loaded. I felt like super, super rich because none of my friends were making 96 quid a month. And I was like, yeah. yeah. And then I could kind of pay for my own cinema tickets and stuff like that. When you're starting out and you don't have any extra skills, I'd recommend kind of just doing something like tutoring because it's very easy to do. And you can use your academic skills if you've got those to, to kind of do that. But then quite early on, after I taught myself to code, I started doing a freelance work for like, you know, on the internet, you can hire out your services to random people on the internet. It sounds weird. You know, I, do, I made a few websites. I got a few hundred quid that way. Yeah, there's there's uh, a lot of sites where you can do random stuff. I remember when I was about, I think when we were sort of uh, mid teenagers, we were both really into trying to make a quick buck online rather than doing something actually meaningful and valuable. Yeah. And so I used to do psychic readings for five bucks a pop. <laughs> oh, on Fiverr. <laughs> on Fiverr, yeah. I yeah. think I made about $100 doing psychic readings online, which was a lot of money uh, as a 15, 16 year old. Um, and then yeah, design development stuff like you did. Cool. And we can talk more about your psychic reading thing at a later date. If you guys are interested, leave a comment down below and we'll do another video with Tamer where, where he shares the, the technique for doing psychic reading. So the next question is, what's been the single most worthwhile investment for your personal development with investment referencing time, financial or otherwise? It sounds like he's been listening to the Tim Ferriss show. That's easy, Kindle. Getting a Kindle has been the single most worthwhile investment of my life, except maybe getting the camera because then I started the YouTube channel. But Kindle completely changes the game for reading books. It means when you think of a book or when you hear a book recommendation, you can immediately buy it. It means you can read in bed, you can read in the toilet, you can read wherever you are. You're not distracted by notifications by using the Kindle app on your phone. And it just it just changes the game. And there, there are actually studies that show that people who use e-readers read about 50% more books or something than people who don't use e-readers. So Kindle is the thing I always recommend. For me, it was specifically learning design and learning how to code. But really that's what just- that? uh... that? <laughs> Learning how to code. <laughs> All right, okay. <laughs> I don't like it when you tell people you don't need to learn how to code to set up an online business. Exploring your own interests and taking the time to actually learn new things that you're interested in has been very valuable for me. I didn't know that tech was a career that existed. I didn't know I would end up like trying to do this as a job or anything like that. I was sort of exploring my own interests in design and uh, you know making websites and things. And that happened to lead somewhere quite good. So I'm really glad I kind of actually did that when I was in school. So I, yeah, I think it's uh, really valuable to kind of cultivate your own interests in things and explore stuff on your own. Uh, I think most of the valuable stuff I've learned has not come from school or university. It's come from like random stuff that I'm just doing on the side for fun. Have you ever struggled with your mental health? If so, how did you cope? <coughs> Thanks, love your vids. Yeah, there've definitely been periods of my time, uh, periods of my life where I have struggled. I remember in third year of university, there was one particularly dark week um, and I don't think anything in particular happened during that week that uh, sort of affected me badly, but I think I was just really depressed for about a week. I don't think I left my room. I was having cereal, three meals a day. At one point I paid my roommate 10 pounds to go, go literally just outside the college and buy me some chips from a kebab van. But yeah, it was a really dark time. I think, I, I think it just sort of wore off. Maybe I was fortunate in that respect, but I think having a good support network of friends, yeah, I think one of the realizations I had was that I had you know, really good friends who, you know, loved me unconditionally and, and I thought that was really valuable and that kind of got me out of that phase. But yeah, I always have days like this. Um, I actually haven't, I've never struggled with my mental health, thankfully. Um, they say it affects one in four of us at some point. So maybe it'll happen at some point, but so far I've been very fortunate. But yeah, if you are struggling with mental health, step number one, see a doctor because this is like a medical thing. We can do stuff about it. Um, but secondly, yeah, support network is really important. What's the most valuable thing you've learned in your life so far? I don't know how to, that. This, <laughs> is not a, this is not a question that is possible to answer. This is a, sort of a question from someone kind of wanting a quick fit. Oh, I, mean, I mean, I don't know. I think it's, I think it's good. It's good to ask these sorts of questions because occasionally you get snippets of life advice that you wouldn't otherwise kind of arrive at. One thing that I've uh, been appreciating a lot is that everyone is making it up as they go along. No one has all the answers. This is something that you preach a lot uh, as well. Look, the thing is you could, you can say this, and this is undoubtedly stuff that you would have heard, you know, 15 years ago, and you wouldn't have been able to appreciate it at the time. Like, these are things that, sure, you can hear them, and, and these are all cliches, right? Like, you're told all of these cliches from a really young age, and at, at various points in your life, you kind some of them actually click, and you kind of actually understand what they mean. And that's not because anyone has told you that thing, you know, you, you won't hear this on a YouTube video and immediately get what Ali's trying to say here. Like, I don't think there's any value in trying to say these things. I think there is value in trying to say these things because the objective is not to say something on camera and then 30 seconds later, someone's life has changed. Right. The objective is to be again, yet one of those people that are hammering these cliches home because, and there's another good phrase, the secrets of life are, are hidden behind the word cliche. Like things are cliche for a reason. 
And eventually, when you get old and you start giving people life advice, you're gonna start reciting these cliches to them and you're gonna be like, oh, but there's, there's so much context tied up in this cliche and there's so much background knowledge that you just can't get across by saying the phrase. But having said that, I think saying the phrase is still helpful. For example, money doesn't buy happiness. Sure, for some people, it's gonna click fairly early on and they're gonna realize that, oh crap, I've been chasing money and it's actually not been helpful. For a lot of people, they're gonna think, yeah, easy for you to say, you're really rich and they're gonna try and chase money and eventually they realize for themselves that it doesn't buy happiness. There are still some people that the, the cliche is still, is still helpful to. Yeah, all right. What are your thoughts on finasteride for hair loss? Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Just today, I my uh, order of finasteride arrived. I ordered like six six months worth from uh, some simple pharmacy.co.uk or something. You've been using it for longer than me. I've been using it for a few months, but I think there's some weird rules around doctors recommending off-licensed drugs, so I'm not allowed to say anything on the topic. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so, finasteride. <laughs> Uh, no, I mean, I've, I, it seems like it's the only thing, it's the only like hair loss thing that's backed by research. Uh, apparently it works for like 70% of men. Who told you that? I think I did. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but you're not allowed to say that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I, I heard from, you know, credible sources. <laughs> friend of a friend. <laughs> friend of a friend. Uh, it's like the, the only sort of legit hair loss thing. The side effects don't seem too bad. Don't take my word for it. Don't take his word for it. You should probably look into this and talk to a doctor. Does hard work always lead to success? <sighs> How do you feel about that sort of question, Tamo? There's no valuable answer to be given here. <laughs> I don't think, yeah. I think the answer is, well, it depends how we define success. It depends how we define hard work. <laughs> and I think if you're doing what you like and the work is fun, then you're inherently successful. If you had a spare thousand pounds floating around, what would you do with it together? Um, and let's add the caveat that you're not allowed to just invest it in Bitcoin or stick it in the S&P 500. <laughs> um. mm. I know what I would do. I would take us on a cruise for like, two weeks. Mm. I've been reading these things about cruise ships and how that it's like the best place to get work done because everything is sorted out for you. Your bed is made, you, your food is free, etc., etc. If you find a good deal, it costs maybe 50 pounds a day to actually live on a cruise ship um, for like a two week period. And you can use that time to just bash out a ton of work. So you can do your coding. I could try and write a book. You know, you can do whatever you want on a cruise ship. And I think yeah. that would be a very valuable use of a thousand pounds. Yeah, it also sounds like a novel sort of cultural experience. Like, cruises are kind of weird, right? Like, <laughs> who had this idea? Let's get a massive ship. <laughs> get people to pay money to sit on this ship on holiday. It's crazy. Um, it would just be cool to experience that. Uh, Ahlam says, hey guys, I just finished university a few months ago, but I now want to study data science. Any tips? Right, right. well. <laughs> 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 that was good. Thank you. Tamer was a data scientist. Do you want to, do you want to answer uh, that? Yeah, one? so my first job out of university was as a data scientist. I think if... Firstly, what is a data scientist? Like, what, what do they do? It means a lot of different things nowadays. Essentially, the reason this title exists is, I think, because lots of companies now have lots of data, uh, especially if they're a tech company. You'll have data coming in from, you know, the finance department of you know, money coming in and out of the company. You'll have data coming in about your products and, and so on. And there are helpful things that you can do if you analyze this data. So for example, at the company I used to work, we were in the property space and we were trying to use data to figure out a way to automatically figure out the value of a house. So you don't need someone to go and visit the house, you just have a bunch of data about the house and boom, this house is worth 500K or whatever. So that's roughly what a data scientist does. In terms of actually getting into it, I think as a graduate, it's kind of hard because it's not as developed a field as say software engineering or other kind of roles. And so there's not really many graduate schemes for people um, who've just graduated and want to become data scientists. I think the way I sort of did it was to make sure I had like a solid foundation and the things I needed. So I studied maths at university and I specialized in statistics, which is very in line with the kinds of things you need to do as a data scientist. I also knew how to code, which is really, really important. So I think- Wait, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> what was that? <laughs> That's right, continue. Yeah, so I think fa foundationally, learn Python. That's uh, that's sort of the the lingua franca of, uh, of data science. My God. How about that? <laughs> um, yeah, learn Python, learn statistics, sort of like a fa foundational kind of statistics so you understand, you know, pitfalls uh, when, when working with data. To be honest, I got a bit lucky in that I reached out to a startup in London that seemed really cool. Their needs aligned with mine. So try and find a company where you think you're actually interested in working there. Um, and typically, if it's like a smaller startup, they're probably more willing to take a bet on a recent grad than if it's like an established company with very established like hiring protocols and things like that. So you've told this person that you'd recommend learning Python and learning stats. Yes. I suppose that, that kind of begs the question for most people, <coughs> how, how do I go about learning Python or how do I go about learning stats? Do you have any thoughts on the how to, how to learn stuff? Front. I think I think the the Python one is more straightforward because you can kind of do I don't know, there's I haven't actually done any of this stuff myself so take this with a pinch of salt there there are sites like Kaggle where you can do data science challenges and so what a lot of people do uh, just to kind of get up to speed and practice their skills 
is to like do these challenges on Kaggle. And then when you apply to jobs and things, you can you can say, oh, you know, I've done these like Kaggle challenges. I know these kinds of techniques and stuff. So I think that's a bit more tractable. In terms of learning stats, I feel like in my case, I just studied this stuff for four years and at some point things started to click and that was kind of independent of what I was studying at the time. So like in fourth year when we were doing some, you know, Bayesian inference stuff, then that somehow shed some light on some like really fundamental things. And I, I sort of developed really good intuition around like really basic stuff. Um, so I, I actually don't know how I'd advise someone to study stats. Okay, fair um, enough. And if you're kind of stuck at the bit before you've actually even taught yourself Python, um, the thing I was trying to get you to say was just kind of Google it. Because <laughs> if you want to learn Python, if you want to learn the basics of Python, you would start by Googling it, following some like online course or something. Oh yeah, yeah, And yeah. then you can start doing all this Kaggle stuff. Yeah, once, yeah. Once, once you've learned it. But yeah, I suppose yeah, that, that was such a given. That, that, yeah, that's a given. Yeah, of course. Google it, online courses, these are all really good. Did either of you ever deal with imposter syndrome? And if so, how did you deal with it? I think I had this for a while in like tech stuff, um, but after, yeah, just hearing enough about, oh God, this is gonna make you seem right about something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hearing, hearing enough people talk about imposter syndrome and say that, you know, everyone's making it up, it eventually sunk in. <laughs> Yeah, so I had imposter syndrome big time when I was in my fifth year of university and I was co-directing the, 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 the clinical school pantomime. And the other co-director, his name was Will, he was like amazing. He was like, had tons of theater experience, was a really good actor, incredible singer, like had been doing this for, for years and years. And I had zero acting or zero theater experience at all. So he like, knew what he was doing and I had absolutely no idea. Every time we'd have a rehearsal, I was kind of thinking, oh, I bet everyone's thinking that, oh, that's, that's a really crap director. <laughs> Very quickly I realized, hang on, no one is thinking about me. Everyone's just worried about themselves. People don't give a toss about what I'm feeling or how I'm coming across. You know, as long as I'm being friendly and happy and doing a reasonably okay job, people are going to be so tied up in their own in their own selves that no one's thinking about me at all. And I think that well, uh, well, once I had that realization, which again came from hearing phrases like, you know, you'll stop caring so much what others think of you when you realize how seldom seldom they do, and cliches like that. You know, just internalizing that made me realize no one cares, it's all good. And then the imposter syndrome vanished. Favorite piece of tech released in 2019? I don't think I've bought any new tech in 2019. You bought that monitor. Ah, I got, yes, the new uh, Apple 4K. It's not Apple, it's LG. <laughs> new LG 4K <laughs> uh, monitor. It's very nice. They haven't made any particularly groundbreaking moves with it. Apple have been doing LG kind of uh, retina display monitors for a while. There's a bunch of other like, uh, you know, retina equivalent monitors from like Dell and NEC and stuff that are really good. It's a nice monitor, it yeah. looks all right. I'm gonna mention this in my next monthly favorites video, but there's this like a uh, massager thing that you like put on your back and you plug it into the wall and then it kind of gives you one of those shiatsu massages. So that's oh, been, man. yeah. My, my back actually really hurts right now. Yeah, this, it's, this it's, is a, it's actually a really awkward sitting it's, position. It's, it's really comfortable <laughs> sitting on the sofa, trying to sit up straight and also sort of leaning forward, you get kind of that lower back pain. Yeah, yeah. Oh, they said we have to lean forward. You have to lean for forward. the camera. Yeah, that's to be, what we're to seeing be, like this. To be more engaging, otherwise we'd kind of be lounging like this and. Which would be a lot more comfortable. <laughs> it would be more comfortable, but then the microphone's not gonna pick it. Anyway. All right. Yeah, so I'll, we'll, we'll put affiliate links in the description below for all those things. And that brings us to the end. All right. Of this kind of life advice segment of the Q&A. Thank you very much for watching. Hope you found that useful and gained maybe something from it. Um, if you like the sort of life advice sort of stuff and you've stick, stuck with us to the end of the video, there's going to be a video over there that's like other sort of life advice stuff. And you can check out our podcast, uh, notoverthinking.com, but it's also available on everywhere else where you get podcasts, like, like wherever you get your podcasts. iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, blah, 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 all that stuff. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.